I don't know if there has ever been a time in history when the news is crazier. We have information coming out that perhaps there was an assassination plot against the former president, Donald Trump. Uh, so much more going on. I have Grant Stinchfield with me. Grant, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Stephen. So um, you, you've been covering this on your news uh, company channel. Uh, this new revelation coming out that the FBI and the Department of Justice gave permission to use deadly force against Donald Trump, his Mar-a-Lago property, and the people. This is terrifying. This order comes right from the top. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I, I've, I've, well, one, there is nothing standard about going in and raiding a former president's home, especially one like Mar-a-Lago, which happens to be a club where you have guests and all kinds of other people there. So this, this search warrant that they executed, not only is it unconstitutional, but Stephen, the idea that they would add this use of deadly force um, piece of, of document, it's, it's, it is actually standard operating procedure. All right? I've talked to a lot of FBI agents. In this document, this deadly force paragraph is in every search warrant they serve. So when they say it's standard operating procedure, as much as I would like to say it's not, it is, and look, a law enforcement officer, no matter where they go, they have the right to use deadly force if they feel their life is in danger. But my argument to this, Stephen, is that Mar-a-Lago is not standard. This is not your standard search operation. At some point, you've got to say, you know what? The public is going to see this. How is the public going to interpret this? This never should have been in there. And some of the wording of if the former president of the United States, F POTUS, as they put, were to show up during the raid, you have the right to engage with him and the United States Secret Service. So what does that mean, engage with You have the right to take him out? Is that literally saying you have a right to, to violently, you know, apprehend or, God forbid, shoot the president of the United States? You read into it that it'll say there's point of contact for you to call if this was to happen. The bottom line is, whether you believe the FBI that this was standard operating procedure or you believe those on the right that says this is an assassination attempt, the reality is somebody should have had a level head in the center and say it could be perceived as an assassination attempt or standard operating procedure doesn't work well when you're going in to see a president. Who's running this show? This is a, a clown show. And of course, it gets back to Merrick Garland is. He admitted that he signed off on every aspect of this raid. It should have been planned out. This should have been taken out of the original search warrant just so we didn't have what you and I are talking about here. Yeah, well, Senator Josh Hawley grilled him on this, and, and Merrick Garland like was left in a stuttering stupor. Like, like he, he did not know how to explain why he would sign off on this with permission yeah. to, to go in on Mar-a-Lago and like you say, there, there's just nothing standard about this. And in fact, um, this morning I was thinking, my goodness, this look, this sounds like a James Patterson novel, right? So uh, the, the sitting president and his team have a closed door cloak and dagger meeting. They decide that they will send the past president more documents than he knows what to do with. They'll make all of these demands on how to keep them safe, secure. Then they'll demand them back. And over and over again, they'll harass him for the documents. He will then have to put a plan into motion on how to protect those. Meanwhile, they're putting a plan in motion on how to attack the Florida compound. If people are hurt, so be it. If the president's hurt, so be it. We must get those documents back. And if you can't kill him, at least kill his reputation so that voters think that he's a spy who sold out the country under the Espionage Act and put him in jail for 700 years. I mean, this sounds like a novel. Yeah, it sure does, but it's it's reality. It's a total setup job. And, you know, you say something that's the most frightening of all. They know they can't get him now in the courts. You had the Biden administration working, as you mentioned, with the setup job with the National Archives, the whole Jack Smith nonsense. Then you have proof that they were working with Alvin Bragg's office in New York, the Biden administration, working with a local prosecutor in, in Georgia, Fannie Willis. We got to get Trump, get Trump, get Trump. They can't get him. I'm telling you, 
Their last resort is to kill this man. The Secret Service has got to be so on point when it comes to this. And, and one final point on the raid on Mar-a-Lago, this tells you what their respect is towards law enforcement, that you're going to put a blue-on-blue blue situation to heavily armed federal law enforcement agencies now standing off face-to-face, -face. the Secret Service with a direct mission to protect the former president of the United States, the FBI with an unconstitutional uh, mission to go search Mar-a-Lago and steal these documents back from President Trump. This could have been a recipe for disaster. Maybe there was some secret hope that they wanted him dead. I I'm, I'm convinced right now that's the only way they stop President Trump, and I say that with utmost fear in my heart that this happens and the secret service better be doing their everything they can to, to ensure it doesn't, because I don't think there's ever been a threat level against a president like there is against president Trump right now. Yeah. Well, months ago, Tucker Carlson alluded to this on the Adam Carolla show. He said, you know, it's all trending towards having this guy taken out. Uh, I just don't know how to look at it any other way. Um, President Biden, the White House is refusing to say whether he will be on any kind of uh, stimulant or drug or pharmacology for the end of June debate. It's obvious he's on something. He comes in, uh, hopped up, wired harder than Beavis and Butthead. So uh, for the is state that of true? the union, they refusing to say it. They're refusing to. to they I didn't said even we see can this. either confirm or deny that he'll oh. be on anything. That's unbelievable. I mean, it was one of the first things that I've said, and, and a lot of people are saying it as well, that he needs to be drug tested. Now you got members of Congress saying it. President Trump is saying it. And, and I would say you drug test him 20 minutes before the event. Because, look, you can pop an Adderall literally five minutes before you go in. Put that under your tongue. You, that'll get you through the next three hours if, if, if you had to. You test him before and after the event. That's what I would say. And specifically for methamphetamines, right? That that's That's... We know he's on it. You see the widened pupils. You see the dark eyes. You see the hyped up form of speech. Anytime there's an important event, it, it's, I say hilarious to me that, that you've informed me that they're not saying this, neither confirm nor deny. I mean, literally, you think you just lie and say, no, we're not drug testing a sitting president. You're outrageous if you think we're doing that. You know, you can believe anything you want, but he's the president of the United States. We're not drug testing him. That's what I would say. And meanwhile, I know he's hyped up on drugs. To neither confirm nor deny, this gets back, Stephen, to my 100% belief that Operation Oust Joe Biden is well underway. The debate is a setup for him. The Hunter Biden speed up of the trial, now bringing out his ex-girlfriends. We know that Joe Biden it, it runs the DOJ, at least the Biden administration. It's his DOJ. They're bringing all these ex-girlfriends and ex-wives to sink Hunter. They're going to embarrass him with Hunter Biden. The screw-ups in the teleprompter. Somebody's putting those screw-ups in there so he looks stupid. Come convention time or shortly after, they're going to try to force this guy out. I, now I'm seeing it more and more and more. Yeah, I, I think that you're on to something. I mean, I just, like, when you juxtapose um, his, his final debate with Trump or the States of the Union address with just his normal everyday speech, I mean, he, he can barely get his words out. He reads the quiet part on the teleprompter. He's mixing up dead people and hostages at his events. Something is obviously wrong. And the proof of that is, look at this Robert Herr special counsel thing. They're, they're now about to hold Merrick Garland in contempt of Congress for withholding these audio tapes. What is so damning on these audio tapes that they don't want us to hear with, with Joe Biden answering very simple questions about why do you have uh, top secret documents as a senator? Yeah, I, and I think what's even more damning than that is he can't remember when his son died. He can't remember how his son died. He can't remember when he was vice president or not. It's these little things that are going to be the most damning. I'll be the first one to admit it. You know why I want these tapes? I want these tapes so the American public can hear that we have a dementia-ridden president and understand it's a national security risk. I want to use it for President Trump's campaign. But this is a national security risk, so it can be two things. You can use it for national security, as the Republicans in Congress are claiming, and you can use it for the campaign. Both are valid reasons because we've got to inform the American people they can't uh, afford to vote this guy back into office. But let me ask you this, Stephen. Where are the Republicans are holding him contempt? I thought last week we were told it's going to be tonight. We're going to do it. Well, I'm waiting 
You, you don't think if this was the roles were reversed, Democrats would already have him impeached and hauled in and, and probably put in handcuffs if they could. Yeah, my my big contention with the Republicans is they're all talk and no bite, right? It's like all bark, no bite. That Like they could have held Hunter in contempt. Uh, they could hold Merrick Garland in contempt, but they don't. Right. They don't. They like they think that being the nice guy is is the right thing to do. And yet the Democrats will steamroll you like they were impeaching Donald Trump before they had any evidence to impeach Donald right. Trump. That's right. And, and so it's like they're they're just they're winning by being the first mover. Laura Trump had said something to me. I interviewed her the other day. You know, she's now one of the co-chairs of the RNC. She says the Democrats have played dirty for so long. We need to start playing dirty. And I was so relieved when I heard a leader of the Republican Party just say that word. Now, she didn't mean we need to break the law. She didn't mean that we need to go out and do anything nefarious. What she meant was we need to get down and dirty like the Democrats do. They'll hold you in contempt and they'll do it in 2.9 seconds. We need to start acting like that. And if we don't act like that, we're going to lose again. And, And here's the real reality. President Trump, when he's in office, gets Republicans act for some reason what is once an amoeba all of a sudden becomes a T-Rex when President Trump is in office. The moment he leaves office, that T-Rex turns back into an amoeba. It's the most amazing phenomenon I've ever seen when it comes to this party, the Republican Party I'm talking about. So that's just another reason why we need President Trump back in office. Yeah, I don't have the exact details. I'll have to look these up. But I I had a guest on the other day. He said that the, the Republicans actually signed a document 40 years ago that for 40 years, they would never question the outcome of elections. And if you go back and look, there's there's hundreds of you know hundreds of hours of, of Democrats denying Republican elections, but there's almost nothing. Like even uh, Al Gore versus Bush, it was it was Al Gore that questioned that. So for for four decades, Republicans have been out of practice for being hard, being tough, questioning elections. And the first time they do it, boom, they immediately, they try to squash everything down. You will never do this. They go after Trump's attorneys. They go after all the J6 people. I mean, they're, they're going after everybody they can. I, I think I read that there's like uh, uh, almost 400 different people related to Trump mm-hmm. that they have lawsuits pending against at this very moment. I mean, it's just like, it, it's crazy. And yet they have the power, uh, you know, these committees in Congress have the power and yet they don't do anything with that yeah. power. Yeah, I, I'm with you. It it doesn't make any sense as to why they just sit on their heels. It, it, the only explanation to it is that the uniparty is very real and that all of these career bureaucrats, career politicians are in cahoots together. Um, I, I think Republicans often confuse supporting the rule of law with an inability to fight. Oh, well, if we support the rule of law, we're supposed to be gentlemen and not fight. Well, you can support the rule of law and fight. Add into it the uniparty, the Washington establishment, the the just need and desire to be invited to the right parties up there, meaning cocktail parties. All of that plays into why Republicans lose constantly. But I do see it somewhat changing. The Freedom Caucus now in Washington has more power than it's ever had before. We see this with the speaker fights. Who gets most of the coverage? Freedom Caucus members of Congress get most coverage. Oftentimes, the mainstream media is trying to make it negative, but to all of us, it's positive coverage, right? So things are starting to change. President Trump could put this whole thing over the top if he gets back in. And remember, he's going to be a one-term president. He doesn't have to worry about getting reelected. He can do whatever he wants to make sure that we get this country back on track. Yeah, I know. It's uh, it's kind of exciting to, to think about, really. Um, okay, how about this Michael Cohen's uh, Stormy Daniel thing completely blowing up in New York's face? Like, this looks so bad. This makes Trump look so good. Cohen's gets on the stand and they're like, okay, you're you're an admitted serial liar. Yes. You perjured yourself and went to jail. Yes. Uh, you know, you, you stole from the Trump family and the Trump organization. Yes. Like, it, he looks so bad. What are what are your thoughts on this whole thing? Yeah, you made $4 million, I think he said, selling 
anti-Trump gear in your podcast. You want a reality show to go after Trump, and now you want to run for Congress as well. I mean, literally, he admitted all he wants to do is be famous. Um, this whole thing is a sham, and I'm going to put it this way. Everybody watching this, whether you're on the left or the right, have heard every single pundit explain that it's a kangaroo court and the judge is biased. He's a probably We know this. I'm at the point now where all I have is frustration. I'm looking at this and saying, how is this judge getting away with what he's doing? I want to do something and I feel helpless because there's nothing I can do. There's only so much I can shout on the airwaves and the podcast and, and Real America's Voice uh, on how devious the Democrats are that they have a shill literally running a trial against their number one political opponent. I, I want to do something and I can't. And it's when I realized I saw President Trump with a look of frustration I've never seen before last week comes out of the court. And it's not to be mistaken for weakness, but the frustration that what is happening to him, this railroad job of a trial, and there's nothing you can do about it is, I don't know what other word to use in frustration, maddening, but it's a very sad place to be in America when the justice system isn't the justice system. It's not even a shell of a justice system. You don't have a presumption of innocence anymore with this judge. President Trump's presumed guilty and he's pushing that presumption of guilt onto this jury with every single ruling that he makes. My only hope and prayer is that these New Yorkers can act like New Yorkers and, and have some critical thinking skills and not be scammed. You know, New Yorkers are pretty smart. They hate President Trump. They, they, don't, they didn't want him in office. I'm sure every single one of these jurors is, is a Biden person. But New Yorkers don't like to be scammed. And there's a there's a history of the mafia in New York and what looks like people being persecuted. You know, John Gotti, for whatever reason, I'm half Italian. but John Gotti was a hero in New York. The things that this guy did was crazy. I hope some of that at least infuses the jury and starts asking questions about this federal government, the, the local government, the, the prosecution here, Manhattan District Court and and say, you know what? Enough is enough. We've got to say no to this and a full acquittal. I, I'm predicting a full acquittal. Maybe it's just wishful thinking. I'm like the only guy that's predicting this, but this is my prediction. A full acquittal. I think New Yorkers will do the right thing here. Yeah. Okay. Let me, let me put, uh, let me throw out two things that are kind of encouraging to me. Uh, number one, I, I would have thought that New York would just be like a hundred percent Democrat, but the number one city, according to YouTube analytics that watches my show is New York city. <laughs> <laughs> which, which was like really surprising for me to dig in. I was like, wow, that's amazing. All right. Uh, Have you ever seen Private Parts, the movie about Howard Stern? Uh, no. All right. So you need to watch it. So there's a part in that in that movie, and it's a documentary about Howard Stern and, and his life as a radio jock, where the programmer comes in and goes, it's the most amazing thing. The people who love Howard Stern w listen to his radio show for an average of 12 minutes a day. He says, but the people who hate Howard Stern listen for an hour and 20 minutes a day. <laughs> and so it may be a case of you frustrate them so much, Stephen, that they just can't help but the, themselves from to tune in. And so if there are you in New York right now watching, I hope I'm not going to scare them away from you. But you know who you are, and you're watching this guy right now, and you hate to love it, but you love it so much and you can't stop watching. Because there's a little part of those people in New York that see the truth that you're pushing out there, Stephen. That's yeah. what's going on, man. Yeah, I know. It's it's exciting. Okay, the last thing is, I don't know if you saw this, but this morning, Representative Elise Stefanik of New York has officially filed an, an ethics complaint against Judge Juan Mershon. Um, and I think that you're going to see people like Alan Dershowitz glom onto that and other lawyers where they're saying, wait a minute. Uh, his daughter is making millions of dollars off of this trial. Um, you know, you have Representative Dan Goldman, who was literally doing witness prep with Michael Cohen and then sending hundreds of thousands of dollars right to Juan Mershon daughter's private residence in, um, in Virginia. Um, another representative in New Jersey that told Donald Trump, get out of our state. She sent hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, just just today, uh, I read Cory Booker has sent over three hundred thousand dollars. These are all people calling for Donald Trump to be removed. 
this is total conflict of interest. So I do see the tides changing and uh, it's exciting to see it, in my opinion. Yeah, it most certainly is. I mean, you have those overt actions of bias. I would all offer up corruption, ethics violations. But then you have the ones that are so obvious in the courtroom, but aren't as obvious to the public because we're not in the courtroom, where you let Michael Cohen ramble on and on and on and Stormy Daniels ramble on and on and on. But you get a guy like Robert Costello, a former federal prosecutor who literally speaks to Michael Cohen when they think it's attorney-client privilege and he, and he is cut off and not allowed to tell the full story. You get Michael Cohen declare that labeling this business expense a legal expense is a campaign violation, a campaign finance violation. Michael Cohen can declare that but the judge refuses to allow the former head of the FEC to come in and, and explain why it's not a campaign violation. It, it, they put such parameters on him that he wouldn't even be able to get to explain it. That's just wrong. That's literally taking the defendant's ability to defend himself away from him. I mean, that's not even an ethics violation. I think that is grounds for disbarment is what this, is what should happen to this judge. Yeah, we'll, we'll see what happens. I was really shocked that, you know, he, he like gets into a fight with Costello. Like, are you looking at me wrong? Like, no. And he's like, everyone get out, everyone out. It's over for the day. Like, like some crazy scene out of Ghostbusters where the governor's kicking the Ghostbusters out of his office or something. Everybody get out of here. It's been, it's been wild. Well, I know, I know that we're up against a time clock. I want to be, I want to be respectful of that. Grant, uh, let me push some traffic your way. Yeah. Where can I tell people to go follow you online? So since you have such a huge YouTube audience, I got I got kicked off of YouTube once. So I would love it if people could follow my new channel. I've started Stinchfield Speaks. I think if you just type Grant Stinchfield in, it's one of the first that come up right away in the search box. If you give me a subscription, a subscribe and follow uh, that, check the podcast out there. Um, the easiest way, grantstinchfield.com to find me at all my places. Real America's Voice, 7 o'clock Eastern time every night. Uh, it's a great outlet with some some great content on that network unleashed and, and unapologetic. Nobody's telling us what to say on that network compared to some others out there. So um, those are the places. And of course, on social media at Stinchfield 1776, but the most important with your audience, if you can give me a subscribe on the, on the YouTube channel. Super helpful. Great. I'll just put a direct link so that they can find it easily. And Grant, awesome. thank you so much for coming on. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Hey, Stephen, you're doing such a great job. I so appreciate the fight that you're putting up and taking the message out there. Thank you as well for having me on today. Oh, thank you.